I would like to tell you about new knowledge on the causes of human birth defects. I will divide my talk in three parts. First, I'll tell you that de novo heterozygous mutations are a frequent cause of disease. Second, that the Zika virus is a new type of virus infections that generates many human malformations. And finally, we'll discuss the consequences for society. I earn my living by teaching medical embryology to medical students. And we always teach that the highest risk of malformations is between the weeks four and eight of development. Later on, after eight weeks, is what we call the fetal development. The amounts of malformations greatly decrease and their dangers. And each organ system has a particular time in which it has these malformations. What I'm going to tell you today essentially shifts, turns that on its head. And uh, the first part has to do with the study of congenital heart malformations. The congenital heart disease is the most frequent birth defect coming up in up to 0.8% of all live births. It can be cured with, with surgery very efficiently, but those babies fail to thrive frequently and many die at a young age of unknown causes. So Richard Lifton at Yale, now president of Rockefeller University, he invented a new technique to study this, which is called exome sequencing. So to analyze the mutations that might exist in the children that have heart uh, malformations. But they were interested in proteins. And as you know, proteins are encoded by just less than 2% than our genome. Our genome is encoded in these exons, which are th then transcribed into RNA and then spliced together to make a messenger RNA that is translated into protein. This process of splicing was d discovered by Rich Roberts, who got the Nobel Prize for this, and he'll be here, he'll be here next week, uh, tomorrow. So if you're interested in just sequencing these exons, what Lifton did, he took, made oligonucleotides for each exon. At one end, they have a particle called biotin that allows you to separate them. And so he could separate all the ones that don't have exons to the ones that have exons and sequence them by high throughput. And so what they did, they studied trios of one sick baby and its two normal parents. And they did that for 350 and, and a, another 300 of normal babies and their parents. <coughs> and what was unexpected is that many had malformation of the malformed children uh, uh, had loss of function mutations that were heterozygous, that is only one gene was mutated. And, uh, there were, and that the mutations, therefore, were absent in both parents. Since half of the genes were mutant, this means that the mutations originated in the gametes, either of the mother or the father. But the surprising, so the surprising thing is that there are heterozygous mutations that give phenotype. So many of the mutations were deleterious for protein expression. In fact, these are the mutations of the type that we call premature termination or frame shift or splicing defect mutants. When they looked at the population of children, essentially 85% of children have a point mutation that is not present in its parents. But usually they're silent mutations or synonymous mutations. But in the ones with heart disease, the, the frequency of these deleterious mutations was highly increased. So, uh, so these protein defects give cause to disease, uh, evidently, even if it's just one copy. So some of the mutations were, they got an 85 new mutations in the study. Some of them are, uh, were on a, on, on a certain methylation that takes place in these 
octomers of these proteins called histones. They have one methyl group in a histone H3 and the, in the lysine number four, this methylation. It turns out it must be very important because they found independent mutations in two enzymes that add the methyl group, two enzymes that demethylases, that remove the methyl group, a chromodomain protein that reads the presence of, of uh, the methyl group, is called a reader protein. There's another modification that has uh, the uh, two enzymes that add it, another enzyme that remove it. This one has to be present before you can put this one here, and this one has to be a methyl has to be removed before this methylation has its activation domain. So it's like a cycle of, of this epigenetic control of this histone protein. But many of the, all the other mutations were not in this particular place. And what is interesting about this, the, this cluster of, of genes is that, in fact, they're genes that are expressed in all cells, not just in cells that have to do with heart development. And in fact, what it does, that mutation, is it marks the size of enhancers. Enhancers are these globs of proteins here on the DNA. And this little red mutation here and here, here and here, are this histone H3 methylation. So the, the point here, and this, these then allow the transcription of genes. So the, we have in the human genome, and this has been studied, we have at least 400,000 enhancers that have been identified. They're tissue specific, so in different tissues, you, know, you have different enhancers. In the heart, you will have some. But every enhancer has this m modification on its side. So therefore, some very general biochemical processes can produce very specific congenital malformations, in this case, a malformation in the heart. And it can manifest in another tissue, probably in, in another way, or depending on the penetrance, or give you autism, or whatever, in, in the mutation. So what is most surprising about this, that they estimate, because they got 85 mutations and they got four, uh, four or five that were repeated, you can calculate the total pool from, of genes from which this is coming. And they calculated that about 400 genes would be haploinsufficient for heart development in humans, different genes, by loss of function of just one copy. Similar studies have been done for autism. And again, hundreds of genes have came up, and in fact, the uh, some of them were common, a few. So the conclusion is that humans, we humans, have hundreds, possibly thousands of genes that may cause disease by loss of function of just one copy. And this is something that we've been living with forever, but, but uh, it's really surprising because in Drosophila, which is the best studied animal genetically, that has just a little fewer genes than us, about the same, but there are only nine haploinsufficient mutations in Drosophila. And so in humans, we will have like thousands of these, whether they manifest or not. So this is a, and then the other consideration is these mutations will be transferred with to 50% of the progeny because they are essentially dominant because they're haploinsufficient. The second new development in the congenital malformations has to do with this new epidemic of Zika. It's really, it's interesting because it's just a new disease. Uh, it's, uh, it was found in uh, 1947 in a sentinel mouse, a mouse, a monkey, in Uganda. And uh, they registered a new virus. And then it first infects humans in Micronesia, which is there. And then uh, there was an epidemic in French Polynesia, which is there, and then suddenly, in July 2015, that is just over a year ago, uh, an epidemic of microcephaly comes out in the northeast of Brazil, which is the poorest region in Latin America. And the, this was an epidemic of microcephaly, a very rare human disease, so that was you know, very... Uh, uh, grab the attention of the medical world. And Zika 
it's, it's not a serious disease. It presents with fever, a skin rash, uh, painful joints, conjunctivitis, and blood in semen and sometimes. And for that, we knew, even in 2007, we already knew it could be transmitted sexually. Very rarely, it produces an autoimmune disease called Guillain-Barré, which um, can give paralysis. And uh, so the few cases that have died of Zika have died of Guillain-Barré complications, and most of them are in a little village in, in Colombia, which has been devastated. So, so uh, yeah, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Cuba, it has swept right through in, within one year, this new disease. And um, the reason that this is a uh, uh, so striking disease is that the virus infects the stem cells or the so-called the radial glia of the brain or cortex, which develops during a long time, giving you this microcephaly. So it's the lack of neurons in the brain that gives you this small head. The cortex uh, uh, develops after the base of the brain, so the base of the brain is also damaged, but the m most damage is done in the uh, cerebral cortex in these, uh, by killing these radial glial cells. And the pr this is such a terrible problem because the if you know you compare the size of a coin to the brain of the mouth uh, of the human at one month, it only starts with a little brain of 10,000 cells, and this then you know, develops, but it develops throughout uh, the, the time of pregnancy. You have 100,000 cells by two months, and then you have one million by four months, and it goes on, and it. Uh, you're going to have, what, 10 million by five months. And this is a regular process. So by seven months, you're going to get to 1 billion. That is 1,000 millions. And by birth, you will get to 10 billions. And there might be some more production of neurons after birth, although, or, or it might be that they all come up. So now you see how the brain has grown throughout pregnancy. Look, the coin now is very little. The dime is small. So that's the problem with this. And when it infects late in pregnancy, it will not give microcephaly, but it will give epilepsy and brain calcifications, where I diagnostic of this. So these are, you know, impair greatly the function of the brain. And uh, this disease is transmitted by a mosquito called Aedes Aedes aegypti, which has this very nice shape of a lyre, you know, the musical instrument, <laughs> lyre on the, on the back. But this is, Aedes means, Aedes means odious, and this is odious. It's a, the great enemy of mankind, this mosquito, because it's a, uh, it learned to cohabit with humans 10,000 years ago in Africa when people started bringing water into their dwellings. It can live in very clean water and multiply. And therefore, it has become a vector for Z Z yellow fever, uh, that's what it's most famous for, dengue, Zika, and other RNA viruses. In Kenya, there still are populations of domestic and sylvatic forest mosquitoes that interbreed with each other. And this has been studied, and the domestic ones have the high levels of expression of a particular odorant receptors for human odors, which is called sulcatone. And so, you know, you may know people that uh, mosquitoes like more than others. My wife always complains that they bite her and not me, so she would prefer the other. It's the sulcatone. So, so, uh, so that's what they do. They, they're specialized to smell uh, humans, and even worse, they, they, they bite 20 times a day, and they stay in 
shady parts of the house. They like to be inside the house in a fresh place, and, and they bite 20 times a day in the ankles and in the back, ideal to spend, s s spread the disease, of course, and the female must feed blood, as all mosquitoes, to lay eggs. So, it, uh, Whenever there is water deposits, like in these water barrels, that's where they live. They live in flower pots, in gutters that are humid, in tires, that's how they get dispersed, the Aedes throughout the country, in old tires that are shipped around with a little bit of water in it, this containers, and above all, the lack of sanitation for stagnant water. But there are things that you can do to r remove the, this mosquito. So it lays eggs in humid places waiting for the next rain. The eggs dry when it rains. In five days, they come out and they start this infection system. So substandard housing is, and sanitation is the main problem. In the USA, we were very fortunate because in the Cuban-American War in 1900, uh, Dr. Walter Reed found that yellow fever was transmitted by Aedes, and so we, we have screens in all our homes. We also have air conditioning in all the warm places, so that is very good because we haven't had the epidemics of dengue that has a very terrible disease that has been so powerful in Latin America, but the United States has it much less. So there are many techniques for the tra using these um, mosquitoes to kill, to kill them, uh, and one of them is the irradiated, really irradiate them so they're sterile and release the males in a population so they breed. But they're separated by size, so the female is much bigger, but you can always get a few females uh, spread with it. And although they're sterile, you're releasing females that can give infection too. There's some transgenic line of mosquitoes that do the same, but these don't really work because you have to keep on putting the mosquitoes to kill the population. I will tell you about one that is, technique that is very promising, uh, which is pioneered by Dr. Scott O'Neill in uh, uh, Melbourne, Australia. And it has to do with a bacterium called Volbachia. It's an intracellular parasite, the bacteria there, here, and it infects many, many insects, this type of bacteria. These are obtained from Drosophila melanogaster, and, but it does not infect mosquitoes. So what Scott uh, O'Neill did, he cultured this bacteria from melanogaster for two years inside mosquito cultured cells. And after that, he took those bacteria, injected them into eggs of Aedes, Aedes aegypti, and got them colonized. And that then is a very useful thing, because you have, we have a population that is uh, 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 immunized, and this will then spread. There's this drive phenomenon that uh, Nicole was talking. In this case, it's caused by cytoplasmic incompatibility. It is as follows. If an uninfected female is, in, is mates with an infected male, the bacteria will go and grow in the eggs that the female deposits and most kill most of them. So, but once a surviving female appears that has been infected, it's immune to the infection, it will carry the infection, but it will mate with mosquitoes that are infected or not infected. And that gives us a drive through the population and expands and rapidly takes the whole population becomes infected with the bacterium through this mechanism. And what matters to us here is that Wolbachia, uh, this bacterium, stimulates innate immunity in the mosquito. There's a constant stage of inflammation. The mosquito I I enters into the salivary glands and the gut of the, of, of, of the mosquito. This is inflamed and it becomes resistant to any number of diseases, including the replication of dengue virus and the replication of 
Zika virus. In fact, there will be zero Zika in the saliva if the f mosquito is infected. So this is a very good mechanism. People like it because there's no GMO, or sort of it's a, it's a bacterium in, infected. And uh, the mosquito population stays up because they just don't transmit the disease. And these have been developed, uh, released in Cairns, Australia, and uh, in Rio de Janeiro in small scales so far. But the Gates Foundation is planning a huge release all over Brazil at, of these mosquitoes, infected mosquitoes. And once you have them, you can release both males and females. That's another advantage. You don't need to select them. So this is a very practical new development that may help uh, considerably. Now I'm going to tell you what Nicole was telling you about then, this CRISPR drive mosquitoes. And uh, this is the far west of mosquito control. As you saw, there is there's, there's this gRNA in a nuclease called Cas9 that cuts at a certain cleavage site. And Ethan Beer uh, invented this gene drive for st specifically to, well, to study flies, but mostly to, to apply it to mosquitoes. And uh, you have the Cas9, and it, once it cuts, it can repair the, it can have error-prone repair and give you a mutation, that's what it does, or, or it can repair with the homologous chromosome, right? So. Uh, that's how, how it can be. And so he imagined that it was amazing, the applications probably of this technology is going to be immense. He imagined that if he put in the exact cut site flanking homologous arms in the germline, the, homo the homologous recombination is much more frequent, that then you could put Cas9 and gRNA inside this and make a cassette that will go and implant into the new gene into the new site. And so through the homology, you will put in all this cassette through recombination. And this is an, now a heterozygote fly. But then you have another gamete, but it already has the Cas9 and the gRNA. And so it's going to take the, uh, make both, and it's going to go and infect the opposite chromosome. So this is then why it spreads the, through the population. It's a drive because it has it inside this. Now this technique is expected to be inefficient because they already know that uh, once you get mutants in the guide RNA site, then the cycle is interrupted. You also can get mutations in the Cas9 itself that make it. So there's a certain percentage of resistance, but they, they're, these are genetic engineers. They're modifying it. So maybe one day they can do that. But these have never been released into the wild because you can see how this will go and uh, you know, go right through a population. And in the, in the mosquito they have used, it is a malaria mosquito, which is called Anopheles. And in Anopheles, what they've done in this cassette, they inserted single chain antibodies, two different single chain antibodies that kill the plasmodium. And so they put it into this, and when the Anopheles takes a meal of blood, then it, this comes and kills specifically the mosquito. So they're, that's what they're working on, but uh, that's a kind of sort of the interest of, of these, you know, uh, super far west. Uh, new frontier technology. Fortunately, several vaccines are effective uh, for Zika. It's going to be very simple to make one. And uh, uh, it has been very difficult to do, make a vaccine for dengue, for example. But yellow fever was d defeated by a vaccine. In fact, it's the only Nobel Prize ever given for making a vaccine was given to Max Tyler in 1951 for the invention of the use of the chicken egg to prepare vaccines. And so this then brings us to what we were discussing, that we humans have, you know, let's say hundreds or maybe a thousand of genes that potentially when we have the loss of a single one can give phenotypes and disease. And you will have in these malformed children people that you will be able to sequence and you have a certified not perfect child 
certified imperfect. I will transmit it to 50% of, of its progeny, the possibility of this gene. And you can identify them through small uh, congenital malformations that we all have. We will have 5% of people have some kind of congenital malformation in it. So that is, that's a food for thought. The other thing is that we have hundreds of these babies that are going to be needing gloves and uh, uh, as, as this one and, and a lot of care, evidently. So my view is that the sanctity of life will have to be defended from a modern culture which openly promotes euthanasia if we are to avo avoid the specter of eugenics and infanticide. And St. John Paul, who is right there, uh, looking over us, wrote in 1995 the following. Every threat to human dignity and life must necessarily be felt in the church. Today, 1995, this proclamation is especially pressing because of the extraordinary increase and gravity of threats to life of individuals and peoples, especially where life is weak and defenseless. In addition to the ancient scourges of poverty, hunger, endemic diseases, violence, and war, new threats are emerging at an alarmingly vast scale. So those were wise words and they still appear and will continue to appear, these new diseases, and I leave you with his thoughts and think, I would be happy to answer questions. <laughs>